Welcome back to uh, Capitol Square as we continue our conversation. Representative Batchelder, let me ask you, uh, there used to be a time before term limits when if you had a crisis in state government, I imagined that you could go behind closed doors and deal with folks that you had served with for many, many years and work out a deal, whether it's a combination of tax increases and big cuts or, or whatever. Are you concerned in this particular environment and with so many new faces that the interests are just different and maybe the team is different to try to get some of these difficult things done? It's very, very hard. Uh, the members don't really know each other as well as they used to, obviously. <clears throat> the Senate is somewhat different because people start in the House and go there and some of them do know each other. But uh, when you know people and you've worked with them and you know how sincere they are or not, um, it very definitely uh, changes things. Uh, I can recall uh, being sent down to the governor's office when there was a savings and loan collapse in Ohio. And uh, I wasn't the speaker's favorite member, uh, <laughs> Vern, and, uh, but I got sent down there to work on it because uh, it was a problem for the state and um, we had to address it. Uh, four other states never reopened those savings and loans that had state insurance. Along that same line, is there a little concern that the Tea Party, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. and its involvement in, in helping drive the Republican turnout, which I imagine you would view as a positive, but is there some concern that there might be um, uh, folks watching that expect bigger cuts and bigger things to happen more quickly than maybe they can? I think that's a, a very real possibility. On the other hand, I think if we do a good job of communicating to the public what the problems are and how serious they are and uh, the fact that we are working on a very uh, quick pace to get them handled, I, it's my sense that people will understand that. After all, they make up their own budgets at home. Uh, a lot of them work in factories and retail where they know what the budget is. and. I think it's a real world kind of a thing that I believe people will understand. Senator, how is the Senate looking? There's always been a coalition in the Senate seemingly of Republicans that have been willing to compromise or willing to sit down at the table. As you look at the makeup of the new Senate that you'll uh, deal with, uh, how, how is that shaping up? Well, the, if I can judge by the uh, reaction of the members who are, are knocking on my door and coming in to see me, they're excited about the opportunity to work with Governor-elect Casey. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an excitement that I haven't seen in years. and so. Uh, yes, there will be people who may be a little uncomfortable with some of the uh, suggestions on, on cuts, but you know that's part of the process of, del of deliberation. And at the end of the day, you know the Senate is going to be a strong partner with with Governor-elect Kasich, uh, with uh, Speaker Batchelder. Uh, we look forward to being part of that process and, and being strong partners. Will there be? How difficult is it going to be? I'm thinking back to the last budget and the libraries mm. when library cuts were on the table yeah. and that constituency <clears throat> mobilized very quickly was yeah. down at the state house you yeah. know raising all kinds of concerns and they got i think a big portion of the aid that had been cut to them reinstated um, what kind of advice do you give to your members that are going to be feeling all these kind of <clears throat> pressure points from their local superintendents their local government officials all these folks at home they're going to be impacted by these cuts how are they, I mean, that's going to be tough, don't you think, for some of your new members to withstand? Well, for, for especially for the new members who have not been through that right. before, yes, that will be a challenge. But I would just point them back to the election results. I mean, I think the voters were very clear uh, that they want us to address the problems, and the state has a spending problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have now an obligation to follow through and address those spending issues, regardless of whether, whether it's libraries or, or, or what agency it is. We have to address that, and, and there will be political pressure. Part of our responsibilities as leaders is going to be to work with them and help them understand how to withstand that, uh, but to ultimately they need to follow through on the commitments they made to voters last week. Are there any specific areas of the budget that you personally would like to protect as much as possible or priority? That's the toughest thing for a leader. You don't want to pit take a position which, in effect, puts you in opposition to the other members uh, on something like that. I, I, I personally uh, probably am not going to get involved in any prioritizing in a major sense. I, I think that's up to the Finance Committee originally and, and uh, it certainly looks bad when you're asking people in your caucus to do very difficult things if you're out there trying to protect uh, something that is particularly close to you. And, and I, I would agree that it's very difficult to ask your members to, mm. to stand up to the pressure and, and make that difficult vote if you're on the other hand saying, but don't cut mine. Right. Yeah. I think everything has to be in play. Senator, let me ask you, Jobs Ohio and this um, 
this effort of the governor-elect uh, to basically eliminate or privatize the Department of Development. Mm -hmm. Is that on the table um, in the short term, and is that an indication that we could be moving towards sort of privatization or at least private-public partnerships in other state agencies? Well, I, I would think, not, not having spoken to Governor-elect Kasich uh, since the, right after the election, but I would think that is going to be something immediate that we're going to address because our focus has to be on creating jobs. And, and that's one of the primary responsibilities of the, of the Department of Development is to create the environment, to create the incentives uh, so that companies can create jobs. I, mean, yes. I point back to, a, I was involved in the panel with Impact Ohio last week, and, and there was a, a young woman there who was talking about the number of small companies that she had started. And she had some very specific ideas about how the Department of Development, just by doing little things, could help entrepreneurs and, and she started three or four businesses ultimately sold those to a larger company mm. but she she's in Ohio creating those businesses she's creating jobs and, and I believe the governor-elect and I know uh, the Senate Republicans are going to want to do everything mm. we can to stimulate the economy to create jobs. The interesting thing is there was never a dollar figure attached to that. Do you expect some no. cost savings <clears throat> there? Oh I think so uh, but uh, perhaps more importantly we're going to have people involved who actually have done that kind of work in the private sector to begin with uh, Governor Rhodes, uh, you talk about privatization, he ran a Department of Development kind of out of the governor's office right. in part, and uh, he brought people in uh, from utilities, uh, obviously they want more customers, he brought people in from uh, major businesses, he went to Detroit every other month and had what they call a Rhodes Raiders session where people who wanted to come here could do that, and, and none of that was bureaucratized, it was all pretty spontaneous. But most. Most of what Governor Rhodes did was spontaneous. Right. If the governor's staff came into your office and said, all right, let's get to work on eliminating that income tax, what would you say? <laughs> would that I'd be say, the reaction? I, I, I'd say, did we uh, just get the reaction? <laughs> you got the reaction. <laughs> I, have, I, I believe in the long term in, in, in eliminating the income tax very, very much. Uh, it's been a, those states that do not have an income tax have just grown faster, done better. But at this point in time, I don't think we have that kind of uh, ability to balance the budget having done that. Senator, just very quickly, the uh, Casino Commission appointees yes. uh, of Governor Strickland likely to be given the thumbs down here by the end of the year? Uh, too early to tell, but uh, certainly I think the preference of our caucus is is that we give the incoming governor as much flexibility as possible in, you know, in the fact that the commission really has not been able to do any work at this point. They were appointed late, uh, so they really haven't been able to, to really jump in and, and start moving on, on that process. There's ample time for us to uh, to have the new governor appoint people that he's going to work with over the next mm -hmm. four years. Got you, Kathy. We have about a minute and a half left. Well, I just uh, following up on that. Didn't I was didn't the last governor that left uh, Governor Taft make a lot of appointments on his way out? I mean, that last month. Mm -hmm. And has the Senate been in? Have, has the Senate been confirming anything of late? I mean, is it really fair to ask him to kind of stop governing now? Would it be different than what you've done in the past? Well, I, I don't see where it's any different than what we've done in the past. Uh, we've not been in session to be in a, a, a point where we could confirm anyone since mm -hmm. May. Uh, a number of the appointments that are pending are appointments that were made late in the process uh, by the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, but specifically to the Casino Control Commission, that group just got up and running within the last month. And so they really haven't had an opportunity to, they haven't started to, to get started. And, and so when you look at the impact that that commission is going to have mm -hmm. on on the casino industry and on revenues in the state of Ohio, I think it's incumbent upon us to give the new governor as much flexibility as possible to work with that commission so that he has confidence that they are doing what he needs them to do mm -hmm. so that we can be successful. Speaker like Matt Elder, we literally just have a few seconds left, but if you're in Ohio and watching this program and you hear about what may be coming, what would you say to the people of Ohio? Would you say, hang on to your seats? Or, I, I mean, what is sort of the warning here as we get into 2011? I would say to the people of Ohio, that we have more unused potential than most states in the union. We were once a fast growing state and we can do it again, but it is going to be buckle your seatbelt because it's not going to be something that you can do quickly. It's not going to be something that you can do without pain. Very good. As always, gentlemen, good to see you. Good to see good you. Good luck. Thank you.